Oh, hi, my name is Matthew Leeson, here to give a short talk about quantifying the effect of morphology on second harmonic generation in amino acids, which is a bit of a mouthful, so I'll break it into four little sections, introducing nonlinear optics and organic materials, the experimental methods and modeling we used, and applied to second harmonic generation in glycine microneedles before finishing on some conclusions, which is all centered on finding the effect of morphology on recovering a specific material property? And the short answer is yes, it does affect it in a very slight way. So, just to give an introduction to nonlinear optics and organic materials, I'm sure you're all familiar with linear optics where you have effects such as refraction, diffraction, biofringence, all that fun stuff. But in nonlinear optics, it's just the study of when very intense electric fields, like that found in a laser, is incident on a medium with Raxville. So, say you have a laser of frequency omega, shines onto a nonlinear medium, you have a distortion of the electron cloud, which causes dipole oscillations, the collective of which manifests as a polarization. But because we have this intense electric field, we can model this dipole oscillation as a nonlinear oscillator. So, we get new frequency components emerging that are different from the incident. And if you have an asymmetric structure, so this refers to crystal symmetry, if there is no axis of symmetry in the crystal, you get to keep these new polarization components. So the simplest example of this is called second harmonic, where you convert the instant wavelength into a new polarization that has half the wavelength or twice the frequency. And the efficiency of this process is governed by a material property called chi 2 or the nonlinear susceptibility tensor for the second order. So it's about finding this property and the effect of morphology on it. So what material are we studying this? They're called amino acids. So amino acids are fundamental building blocks of more complicated biomolecules. So amino acids can be strung together to make peptides. Peptides can be strung together to make proteins. And then proteins go on to make cells. So they're very simple. And you can see the typical structure down here. We have our amino group, our carboxyl group and then bonded to a carbon atom, and then with a different uh, radical hanging off one side. So this radical is what gives us different amino acids, and we're using the simplest achiral one called glycine, where the radical is a single hydrogen now. So these amino acids have a lot of great properties for use in nonlinear optics, such as high polarizability, a wide transparency range, biocompatible, and they're piezoelectric as well. So in what scenarios would it be useful to study this effect of morphology? An example of two is given here from biomicroscopy of, say, SHG imaging of muscle tissue, where it's the same area, just looking at the contributions of two different tensor components. Or in a photonics environment, you can see an example of an organic optical interconnect here, where we have our fundamental SHG generated in this hexagonal prism, before being propagated along a waveguide for a nonlinear multiplex signal transmission. But what's often left out for these and could be useful when looking at tissue diagnostics or optimizing device design is the effect of morphology on which tensor components you're probing and how that's affected by it. So we split it up into three little segments where we will look at volume, morphology, and biofringence and the cumulative effect on recovering the chi tensor values. So for the experimental methods and modeling we employ, all measurements, well, most measurements are done on a laser transmission microscope or with a wavelength of 1064 nanometers, which generates a second harmonic of 532. So we record the S second harmonic as a function of the instant polarization, which is controlled with a half wave plate polarizer here, focused onto the sample objective, then collected by a second objective in the transmission before being recorded on PNT. And the sample is raster scanned across 100 micron squares with a piezoelectric scanner. So we get these nice SHG images. So we can record either total SHG, or we can put this polarizer in place and keep it either parallel to the instant polarization to get the parallel component, or cross with respect to the instant polarizer to get the cross component of the SHG. So we have our data set, and now for modeling. So the usual case, with no correction, is just a tensor coordinate transform, then calculate the polarization density based on crystal asymmetry. 
which is shown in red here, and then to study the effect of morphology, we introduce a Fresnel correction at the beginning. So Fresnel correction, which was to model light as a plane wave with x and y components, but after it crosses through the medium, there'll be an attenuation, a distinct attenuation for both the x and the y components, which in turn will affect how the signal is generated in SHG medium. So that's shown in green. Before finally we add another layer to it to account for biofringes. So, and then for quantifying the effect of nonlinear susceptibility, so just the magnitude of the signal in terms of GB meters per volt, we use a small side project that compares using the Kurtz Perry method, which is the standard, uh, versus an acroscopy based evaluation to show the difference in the recovered effect of nonlinear susceptibility. So, in general, uh, most SHG quantification for crystals is done. This curves Perry method, which is a millimeter scale method, where you pack your tube, your crystal into tubes, your crystal into glass capillaries, and then compare the SHG of that tube with your unknown sample to a reference one. But as you can guess, there's voids here, there's particles that shouldn't be included, like dirt, debris, so you get kind of a rough quantification. So instead, we use the microscopy based approach. Uh, detail in this paper here by Garrett Simpson's group, uh, where we compare just particles that are the same size of our unknown to our reference one, and then we exclude potential phase matching particles, which would overestimate our effective susceptibility, as well as removing, say, the stuff that's dark or very low quality, which would underestimate our effective susceptibility. And you can see an example of this here, where we have Kurt Perry, a version of it. Uh, in red, a uh, simple ratio comparison in green, and then this microscopy based evaluation in blue. As you can see here, we actually get a bit of a difference in values. It's small, but I think we're recording in these. So now on to second harmonic generation in glycine microneedles, or the actual extent to this. So I'll just talk a little bit about uh, glycine and how we grow the needles first. So, glycine, uh, very simple to grow. Mix alpha glycine powder in deionized water, drop it onto a glass cover slip, and then wait for it to evaporate. At the edges of the glass cover slip, you get alpha glycine, which is central symmetric, um, so not interesting for this application. But in the towards the center of the droplet where evaporation is quicker, you get these asymmetric uh, micro needles. A couple of microns in thickness and then maybe 20 to 30 microns in length of both beta and gamma phases. So glycine, polymorphic, alpha, central symmetric, not interested for SHG. Beta uh, is mon asymmetric, monoclinic, and then gamma is also asymmetric uh, with tri uh, triagonal structure. So we have our sample grown, and then for the modeling, we need to look at X-ray diffraction to find our growth direction for the crystals. So for beta sample, it was predominantly 0, 0, 1. For gamma, predominantly 1, 1, 1. And then uh, to, to confirm which phase of microneedle we're actually testing, we use Raman spectroscopy for a phase ID, specifically this water vibration around 2950 to distinguish between alpha, beta, and gamma. So now that we have our microneedles, uh, we know what phase and what crystal growth they are, uh, we can start doing a little bit of SHG stuff. So the uh, best way to confirm what SHG, if you have SHG or not, is just simply measure it with a spectrum. So we did this in a separate setup with a broadband laser, doing a point reflection and recording the signal in the spectrometer. And you can see the broadband laser was filtered around 1064 excitation, 10 minus. 10 nanometer bandpass filter. So we'd expect our second harmonic between 520 and 535, which is what we see here. So we know the microneedles are emitting at the correct wavelength. But then we switch to our transmission microscope, where we have a lot more power and polarization control and polarization analysis as well. So a second check is just to test the scaling of the SHG signal as a function of the instant power. So it's a second order nonlinear process. So you'd expect an exponential relation between instant power and harmonic output, which is what we see here, where we get a very close fitting factor of two. So I have to talk about phase stability a little bit as well for glycine. It's not all green fields. 
So I said there's three phases of glycine, alpha, beta, gamma. So in terms of stability, alpha is the most stable, then gamma, then beta, you know, due to this asymmetry of the crystal structure. But so it wants to be alpha, and it will turn to alpha any way it can. So an example of this is shown here on the left part of the screen, where uh, there must be a defect in the microneedle surface. Uh, it got in contact with water vapor, which is present in the air. And this initiated a transformation from alpha phase to the beta phase, which proceeds along the microneedle's polar axis. So this is just an example in terms of SHG, where you can see at the top, to the top of one set of the experiments, at time zero, where we have alpha is black and beta is clear signal from SHG. And then about four hours later, the phase transformation is preceded by about 10 microns. So this has to be kept in mind when doing further testing. Always confirm the phase of each microneedle at the start and the end of each experiment. And then just another example of that is shown here in terms of CARES, so coherent anti-ramin scattering, which is just like a microscopy based and spectroscopy. So we have uh, our white field image, our SHG image, where beta uh, has signal, alpha does not, and then CARES probing the band 2953 wave numbers shows, highlights this phase, as, this piece as beta, and then probing at 2972 wave numbers highlights this piece as alpha. We get a non topodactic phase transformation. Actually, get into the optics now, or into the SHG stuff. So you can see this is for SHG in gamma microneedle, where we have our wide field, our total second harmonic, our parallel component, and a cross component. So you can see this nice uniform shading indicates high crystal, well, uh, high crystal quality. And then we're testing the SHG that's emitted as a function of the input laser polarization. So we get these polar plots going from 0 to 360 degrees. The experimental data points are black, and then our three different models are applied in red for no correction, green for Fresnel, which accounts for morphology, and then blue for Fresnel and biofringence for a phase correction in blue. So we see from the shape of these, the net dipole moment is along the long axis, so along the longest polar axis. And for no correction, just the structure in kind of a rough fit, where the dipole shape is still here, but not widened enough for total. Uh, there's no uh, quadrifold shape, it's missing these extra wings, dipole wings, for no correction in parallel, and then for the cross component, it completely it fails quite badly. Uh, it fails quite badly to reproduce the dipole, the quadrifold shape. After accounting for morphology, we see a fattening of the dipole that's closer to the total expected one. Uh, we still have a dipole shape for the parallel component, and then for the cross component, we actually get a quadrupole shape with the angle is slightly off. And then for Fresnel, so morphology and phase, we actually get a very accurate uh, fit to the total SHG, and then we get a better fit. So we actually have a quadrupole shape now for the parallel component, and a quadrupole shape, quadrupole shape for the cross component as well. And what's actually reflected in the recovery of these susceptibility tensor elements is shown here, where we have uh, an increased contribution due to the longitudinal side, a longitudinal component of D33 at the expense of the first row components, D11 and D15 specifically, where the correction is most noticeable for trying to fit the cross component. So now for the beta phase, same story again, where we have our white field image with total SHG, so this clear, this clear signal on the surface when we made it towards us, parallel component and cross component. You see for the beta phase, for this microneedle in particular, it's all dipole shapes. So for total SHG, we have a nice dipole shape for no correction, the Fresnel correction, and the Fresnel phase correction. But then looking at trying to fit the parallel component of the SHG, we see for no correction, uh, it expects these additional dipole elements uh, that are perpendicular to the main dipole orientation. Uh, counting for morphology removes this correct, removes this expectation, but it also uh, distorts it a little bit where it no longer fits the experimental. 
but then accounting for Fresnel and phase correction, we actually have quite a nice representation where it's the right magnitude with no unexpected side winds. And it's a similar story when trying to fit for the cross component. So still a dipole shape that's well reproduced by no correction, so just following the crystal structure. Accounting for morphology, we get a slightly more accurate fit. As you see, it extends a little bit further to match the experimental data. And then the Fresnel phase correction is extended out relative to no correction, but still maintaining a better fit. Here. Orientation of these polar plots, the dominant polar axis is long axis. And in terms of the effect on the polar tensor elements, we see a much more noticeable contribution from D3 at the decreasing expense of D14, D15. And again, with this increased accuracy and accurate correction. So, just to wrap it up with a few conclusions. Show a small discrepancy between Hertz Perry and microscopy based quantification of the effective anomaly and susceptibility. We show that accounting for morphology and Fresnel correct using a Fresnel correction and uh, fire for engines correction shows an increased contribution from the longitudinal components of the tensor that corresponds to efficiency in the process. And finally, just in terms of effective non linear susceptibility, like not resolving into individual components, we see both phases, beta and gamma have very high values of 14.4 kN per volt and 16.1 kN per volt respectively. So just thanks to the organizers for putting this conference together and for the invitation. Uh, thank you to yourselves for your attention. And this was part of my PhD thesis. Uh, so I still have to thank my supervisors, Nick Christoph, my colleagues, my funding. And I'm currently doing a postdoc at uh, Institut Polytechnique de Paris, in, uh, just south of Paris. So if you'd like any further information on second harmonic or you're thinking about doing some of these experiments yourself, I can be reached there. So yeah, that's pretty much it. And that's just a picture of the Bernal Institute on a very rare sunny day. So yep, yeah, thanks again.